Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Future PLC 2020 Half One Results. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to present the business results to you today. In order to help orientate, I'll just call out each slide that I'm on before I move to it so you can follow us through the presentation. Just moving on to slide two, um, I just wanted to give you a brief update on the key highlights of the last six months before handing over to Penny, who'll take you through the financial detail. I think the headline on this slide, continued strong momentum, the strategy is working, probably encaptures the summary of the business update. And despite the challenging and, un and unprecedented times that we find ourselves in, our strategy continues to deliver. We have over the last six months had really record-breaking audience numbers with average users during the period of 253 million, so just over a quarter of a billion, growth of 26% year over year. Our monetization model is such that this strong audience growth has resulted in double digit organic revenue growth with media revenues themselves up 21% at an organic level. So a really pleasing revenue performance. Of course, core to our business model is our scalable operating model. And that's never more evident by the adjusted operating profit margin, which is up 28, up to 28%, up seven percentage points in the, in the period. And then finally, the operating leverage can be really evidenced and the capital light model um, seen through the improvements in our EPS with our adjusted diluted EPS growth of 60% in the half. Now, it's impossible moving on to slide three to talk to you today about our business without first addressing the impact of the virus. Above all, our pr priority during these times has been about keeping our businesses and our people safe and ensuring that the legacy that we've created so far in our organization continues once we recover from this unusual period. As we thought about how we wanted to respond to the pandemic, we identified three critical groups and specific actions that were required to support in both the short-term extraordinary times and also the longer-term recovery period. So looking first at our people, one of the things we did at Future was move to working from home early. We were, we were one of the first organizations to globally shut all of our offices and ensuring our employees are safe is critical for us. The next thing we looked at was actually creating a hardship fund. This is particularly important for our US colleagues where there's a different government aid model. And we wanted to ensure that no one at Future couldn't afford to pay their bills or couldn't afford to put uh, food on the table. And then following feedback from our staff around increased costs associated with working from home, we also put in place a work from home stipend. As we have all experienced working from home, communication becomes ever more important and we've certainly increased our rhythm and frequency of communications and also the mediums in which we do that, ranging from uh, weekly CEO letters through to Slack chats and virtual town halls like we're doing today with you. And then it's also important to make sure we address individual mental health and ensure that our organization is well and that we're also doing fun stuff. Um, and we try to organize um, virtual social events within across the organization as well. Moving to our uh, business, I think one of the key things was to really make sure that we adapted and flexed our content model to respond to the, re the items that people wanted to read now. Um, and so we really responded to increased search demand around working from home, uh, computer video game playing, and also interest in, in the virus itself. We've also looked to create new virtual events. And a good example of that is with the cancelling of E3. We've actually replaced that uh, with the future game show, which we'll be broadcasting in June. Regrettably, but, but importantly, we also removed and closed loss macing or mar marginal activities during this period. And as a result, we announced a closure of six magazines earlier last month. We've also made sure we reviewed our cost base and that included making sure that we cut down a discretional spend and, and non uh, core activity. We also uh, were delighted to see that many of our colleagues offered to take a pay cut uh, from March when we realized uh, the deepness of, of the short, sharp impact of the pandemic. Um, and while it was great to see everyone uh, respond in that way, we were much more pleased to be able to actually restore pay this month and actually refund them that pay cut as we realized that the business is robust enough to trade through the extraordinary times at this moment in time. However, I should call out the board have continued to take a reduced pay during this period. And then finally, within the business model itself, we've also looked to review our subs distribution models to make sure we can satisfy consumer demands. And then the final area we, we really look to address is around stakeholders. 
and that has ranged from encouraging our staff to volunteer to the NHS through to revisiting our distribution model for magazines to making it easier for shop staff to handle our product through to trying to quickly uh, make decisions about event cancellations to ensure we don't have any of our suppliers incur additional costs. And then finally, we very quickly sought to identify additional working capital facilities to ensure that we could support our business both in the short and long term and also provide flexibility as required uh, for any of our partners. So I'm going to hand over now to Penny who will take you through the financial highlights. Thank you, Zilla. Um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, this is actually the, going to be the last set of results that I have the honour of um, presenting at Future. Um, so it's a, uh, a fun challenge uh, and a real pleasure to be able to, to, to do so uh, in this new format over Zoom. Uh, and also pleasing to have a really strong set of results to, to be able to pre present. Um, as you can see, if I move on to slide five um, with the financial KPIs, you can see a really strong set of KPIs across all of our, um, our key measures. But what's particularly pleasing is the um, measures which are a reflection of the business strategy, which is to create operating leverage by um, uh, creating the platform and have that flow through to high cash conversion. Those metrics are particularly strong with our adjusted operating profits up 77% to 39.9 million. And the operating profit margin has increased uh, seven percentage points over the comparable period to 28%. Now, in preparing these results, I, I went back to uh, the FY17 results just to see uh, the trajectory over the last three years. And if you look back to FY17, we achieved an operating profit margin of just 11% in that year. So you can really see the growth, not just in the year on year, but um, the really stellar growth over the last three years in these results. Um, similarly, we've had very strong cash conversion. So free cash flows are up 45% uh, to 40 million. Uh, and that's pretty much 100% uh, free cash flow conversion of the operating profit. At the end of the half, um, we were sitting in a net cash uh, position. So with no leverage, uh, we subsequently completed on the acquisition of TI Media in uh, April. Um, so we're now sitting with a net debt position of around 85 million. Um, so under one times leverage on a pro forma EBITDA basis. So if I move on to slide um, six, just to cover the results um, in a bit more detail, I've got here the detailed P&L. And you can see here the benefit of the operating leverage as if you look at the table, um, the percentages on the right hand side increase as you walk down the table. So we see revenue growth um, of 33% on total revenues, but that flows through to an increase of 46% uh, on a gross contribution basis, which is a seven percentage point increase in a gross contribution margin. And then that flows through to a 77% improvement in adjusted operating profit. Uh, and again, that same seven percentage point improvement in the uh, adjusted operating profit margin. Now, that improvement in the margin um, is a result of two different factors. The first one is the change in the revenue mix. As, um, as the media grow, revenue streams grow, um, offsetting the decline in magazine, those margins um, are much higher within the media revenues, particularly in digital advertising and e-commerce. Um, so you see a, a big improvement in the margin effect as the, the revenue mix changes. Um, so you can see the overall gross contribution margin in the period was a very strong 81%. And then the other factor is as we scale, we don't think we need the same proportion of overheads um, as, uh, as the revenue growth. Um, so you can see that uh, admin costs and overhead as a percentage of revenue uh, decreased by 1% in the period. We continue, continue to invest in, um, in editorial, however, um, so sales, marketing and editorial costs remain constant as, as, a, percentage of, um, as a percentage of revenue, um, but the overall margin impact still uh, is a growth. So as Zilla touched on, obviously, uh, we need to touch a bit on COVID, uh, which did start to have an impact in the first half, uh, particularly as uh, the UK and the US went into lockdown um, that last week in March. 
we did see um, a shut of travel retail outlets um, and also that's where um, the social distancing measures were, were put into grocery stores. So we saw a reduction of around 1.2 million um, in March from newsstand revenue uh, on magazines. We also postponed uh, three of our consumer events which were due to be held in March. Um, we have subsequently cancelled those events apart from the B2B event uh, which took place in, in April as a virtual event. So that is, uh, was also a, a shift of 5.5 million of revenue. However, we did see an uplift in digital revenue streams, uh, which offset uh, approximately half of that. So if we move on to slide seven, um, we can cover um, revenue streams uh, in a bit more detail. And overall, we've seen um, really strong uh, revenue growth, uh, total revenue growth of 33%, of which the organic growth was 11%. And that's really driven by the strong performance in media revenues up 21% on an organic basis year on year. That offsets the decline in magazines, uh, which declined 11% uh, in total, 12% on an organic basis. So you can see that uh, with that uh, heavy impact of the, uh, of the reduction in revenue in March, um, the, the trend was actually performing ahead of, um, of previous periods. Uh, the comparable period in FY19 was an 11% organic uh, revenue decline. Um, so we were trending ahead of that um, before the impact of COVID at, at the end of the period. And so the overall um, strong growth is due to the media um, growth of 21% on an organic basis. And that's really the on-platform advertising growth, uh, which is digital advertising on our website. Um, and those that grew by 14% uh, on an organic basis. And then e-commerce, which again is continuing to see a very strong performance with organic growth rate of 68%. The off-platform revenue uh, is pr principally new revenue streams that we've added this year from Smart Brief. Uh, which is the email newsletter publishing uh, and also the video revenue streams from Barcroft and then media other uh, principally reflects events uh, and that's why we can see the decline of, due to those cancellations. So the other highlight which is worth touching on here is just that the mix overall um, of revenue significantly changed to an 80% um, media uh, to 20% magazine change. So again, if you if you look back three years to FY17, we were at um, at just 40% of media revenues uh, in that in that year. So you can really see the the significant um, change that we've been able to do in in just that three year period. So then, if we move on to slide eight, um, we can see the mix by geography, uh, and again, this is a reflection of the the real change that we've seen. Uh, over the last three years with US revenues now 60% of the group up from sort of 23% three years ago. And, uh, and that growth is, is very much driven by the high growth rate in the US revenues with the organic growth of 19%. Uh, the UK, which has a bit more magazine and also the events, uh, the organic growth rate was 3% uh, here, but 11% on, uh, on an underlying if you normalize for those event shifts. And again, we can see here um, the real benefit of the operating leverage coming through um, with the gross contribution growth um, more than double the growth in the organic revenue. Um, so the 11% revenue growth translates to 26% growth on a gross contribution basis. Uh, and, and that's really where we see the, the platform effect coming through. So I just wanted to include uh, on slide nine um, a bit of uh, the impact of TI, which, uh, as I mentioned, completed uh, in April. So this shows the half one pro forma uh, revenue. So what, it, what the revenues would have looked like if TI had been part of the business for the whole period. And you can see um, a, a, a bigger swing towards magazines and also UK revenue. So uh, as we look forward, um, we think that futures results uh, with the growth in um, in our media revenue streams and the heavier weighting, we'll actually never see a reported result, uh, which is uh, below 60% media. And as you've seen on the previous slides, the, the growth trajectory really helps reinforce the opportunity for the TI assets within the business. 
Moving on to slide 10, uh, I just wanted to um, provide a bit more detail on the organic revenue growth um, performance. So I provided here uh, a reconciliation of the organic revenues, um, which is a slide we looked at at the Capital Markets Day back in February, if any of you attended um, that event. And this shows the, uh, the total revenue uh, broken down into the 2019 uh, acquisitions of Smart Brief, Mobile Nations, and then the cycling uh, titles that we acquired. And then the 2020 acquisition, which is Barcroft, um, in, in this period, getting bringing us down to the underlying organic um, revenue growth on a constant currency basis, which gives us that 11% growth and the 33% total revenue growth. Look, moving on to slide 11, you can then see what that looks like um, on an operating profit uh, basis. So the chart here bridges um, the FY19 first half adjusted operating profit through to the um, to the comparable period in this financial year, broken down into the organic growth uh, and then the impact of acquisitions. So you can see here uh, the organic growth um, on an operating profit basis. Um, and so within this bar is included all assets which have been owned for at least one full financial year, net of any increase in the central cost centers. Um, and we can see here 9.1 million of operating profit growth, so 40%. We then add uh, the 5.4 million, which is the acquisition adjusted operating profit. So this relates to the pre-acquisition reported um, operating profit from those acquisitions. And then we can really see the benefit of the platform coming through in the platform effect to that additional 3 million, um, which is principally the growth from the acquired assets as they become part of the overall future portfolio. So you can see really strong growth across all of those different elements. So looking at cash flow on slide 12, um, we can see how that flows through to cash um, with very strong uh, operating cash inflow. So an adjusted operating cash inflow of 42.2 million, which compares very favorably to the 39.9 of adjusted operating profit. The other things just to highlight here are um, exceptionals, which relates to the deal fees principally for the acquisition of TI Media, uh, which we announced in October, and, uh, and also uh, the national insurance on uh, the exceptional share scheme that we had, which vested in November. As Zilla touched on, we continue to invest um, in, in future growth, but remain capital light. So we're very efficient with those investments. Um, so just 2.2 million of capex investment with the, within the period. Um, so overall adjusted free cash flows of 40 million. If we move on to slide 13, um, I've just provided a bit more detail here on um, the impact of COVID in the business. And we can see that broken down into sort of four key elements. Um, the first is the digital revenues. Um, so I touched on the growth um, that we saw in March. So uh, as the, the sort of world really went into lockdown towards the end of March, we saw a huge acceleration in audience as our audience communities search for advice and recommendations of, of, of the products that they need and how to operate in this new operating environment. And we saw a 40% um, month on month uplift in March audiences. Um, we there, consequently, we saw digital revenues uh, benefit from that, or, although at a slightly lower um, monetization per user, but we did see a, a big uplift as a result of that audience growth. And this is where we really see the benefit of our Hawk e-commerce technology as uh, we have dynamic linking through to retailers. So as various retailers work through distribution, um, supply issues, the, um, the feeds link automatically uh, and repopulate with uh, where there is stock availability. So we're really able to help our, our audiences um, find the products that they need. The second element um, is, is clearly the impact on magazines um, through shop closures uh, and, um, and principally the, the future uh, titles are, um, are, are sold um, with a bigger mix of sales through the travel uh, retail outlets, so WH Smith and Barnes and Noble. The TI media assets are sold a, a bit more through grocery. Um, so uh, those are short stores have continued to operate, but with social distancing, reducing footfall. 
So we have seen some volatility uh, overall uh, in grocery sales and a, a net reduction in, in magazine sales. So overall, we've seen the market um, trend at a 24% year on year volume reduction. The third element is, is the cancellation of, of events. So I've touched on uh, the three events that we canceled in March. Um, and we now expect actually to, um, to cancel uh, the uh, majority of our events uh, for the rest of this uh, financial year, other than the B2B events, which we're able to hold um, virtually. And the decanter awards, which we're very excited about as part of the TI portfolio, um, which we're expecting to be able to go ahead across the tail end of September and into October. And then the fourth element is just the impact on working capital. Um, so we um, cautiously increased our bad debt provision uh, at the end of, uh, of March with a, uh, a 1.8 million increase, which is a 60% increase in that provision. Uh, although we've actually found that across April and May, um, collections have re remained more in line with the historic norms. Um, but this has enabled us to be able to offer some working capital support to customers um, who are more impacted um, by the pandemic, um, such as caravan parks, um, to be able to offer them a sort of return to advertising as they reopen. Uh, and then we uh, are expecting in the second half to refund um, some events revenue that we collected, um, so totaling around, around 4 million of refunds. Moving on to slide 14, though, um, we can just see this, uh, these digital revenue trends that I was just touching on in the previous slide in a bit more detail. Um, so the chart shows the digital revenue by month um, tracked against the green line, which is online users uh, over an 18 month period. So you can see here that a significant uplift across March and April of online users uh, and consequently an uplift in in, in March and April, but not quite to the same degree. As we look forward to half two, we do expect the audience to normalize um, more in line with the historic growth trajectory uh, and monetization to, to normalize uh, it, it to the same effect. Um, so we remain confident around our, our, our digital outlook for the, for the second half. If we move on to slide 15, um, I've just got a bit more detail on our headroom, on our facilities. Um, so as I mentioned, we're sitting with current net debt at around 85 million. Um, at the beginning of March, um, as we um, looked at the impact of the pandemic, um, we reached out to our banking partners to uh, look for an increase in our, our RCF facility and secured an additional 30 million onto the 135 um, core facility that we have. So total facilities of 165, the 30 million uh, for, the first, for the next 12 months. And that gives us significant headroom of unutilized borrowing, um, which places as well to be able to uh, deal with any challenges. So slide 16, just to sort of wrap up, uh, we've had a really strong um, first half, uh, strong EPS growth and really good uh, free cash flows. And we start the second half with a strong balance sheet. Um, so we feel well placed to be able to navigate the challenges um, of, of COVID. So I'll hand back to Zilla on that note. Thanks, Penny. I was just making sure I unmuted myself before I uh, started to launch into uh, my update. And first of all, I just obviously wanted to say thank you, Penny, on behalf of the business uh, for your contribution and support as our CFO. Uh, you've certainly helped us uh, get to this exciting place in our journey. Moving now to slide 18. Um, and as you see, this is a very familiar slide to all of you, so I'm not going to dwell on it at all, but I just wanted to uh, make the same statement that I make at every set of results, which is there is no change to our strategy. And our focus continues to be very much about the execution of that strategy instead. Moving therefore onto slide nine, I just wanted to um, focus a little bit more about how we are executing our strategy, not just for today in Horizon One, but also the things we're doing today that we think help deliver the goals in the outer years. It's quite a busy slide, so just let me orientate you for a moment. Going from left to right are the core pillars we've talked about, which we think underpin the execution of our strategy growing our existing audience and brands, ongoing diversification, delivering operating leverage, and then continued investment in the business. And then top to bottom are the three planning horizons that we think about when we think about how we run our organization. So horizon one being the activities that we're working on today that we think benefit the business in the short term. Horizon two, very much about the things that we're working on today that have an impact in the next 12 months. And then horizon three is more around planning for the longer term growth. 
Now, there's a lot in here, and I'm not going to go through each uh, bullet point, but I just wanted to pick out a few highlights. In terms of you know, growing our existing brands and audiences, one of the things we've been working on, and which we mentioned before, has been our investment in forums. We think it's very important with the passionate communities that we serve to make sure that we continue to invest in, in the forums, both not just in the Perch brands, but also in the wider future portfolio. And, and that's been a key area of investment in the last six months. In terms of ongoing div diversification, there's a number in, th in things in here you've heard us talk about before, including uh, language formats, tech radar, espanol, podcasting, and then particularly interesting just now is some of our trials around image and video commerce. Thinking about the operating model and how do we continue to support the operating leverage we've seen in the results this year, this half year, um, I think is, is partly about critical investments in our back office systems. In order to grow the business at the pace we have, we have to have systems that can scale. And during the last six months, we've made uh, investments in finance systems, uh, voice over telephony, and also within our BI function. And we certainly think that lays strong foundations for the growth we see coming ahead. And then finally, on the point of continued investment, there's lots of different things that we're going to talk about in this deck and that we've talked about with you in the past. But I just wanted to call out that our headcount actually grew uh, uh, period over period by 27 percent. Um, and including in that would be roles like our new director of data science and BI, which I alluded to a moment ago. Moving on to then slide 20, I just wanted to quickly recap around the three content verticals that we organize ourselves around the business. So we operate three divisions, Future Passion, Future Living, and Future Pro, which is our B2B division. And within Future Passion, we've then got seven verticals, which is a specialist audience groups that we I, I talk to and try to make sure we implement the future wheel. So each of these verticals is like one of our wheels. Um, and they very much, as you know, our model is all about adding more wheels and then more spokes to the existing wheels. Future Living uh, reflects some of the changes we anticipate making as part of the TI acquisition. And then B2B reflects the uh, historic future portfolio, but also the addition of Smart Brief into the business. Now, just moving on to slide 21 and bringing that a little bit more uh, to life, we've long focused on this, the strategy around diversification and, and why that's important to us. And what you can see in this pie chart is the mix of revenues by revenue type um, within our business. Obviously, I think one of the key things to call out is that 80% of the revenue in the period were from non-print related assets. So that's obviously um, really strong progression in terms of where, where the business has come from. And I think is a good indicator of what we'd expect to achieve in due course over time with TI. I think the other thing is that we have, you can really see from this pie chart that we have a genuine mix of, of revenue streams at different stages of the growth cycle, which I think is really pivotal in having a portfolio strategy, which includes e-commerce uh, at 27% of our mix growing at 68% organically, as Penny already mentioned. And then our digital ads uh, accounting for in total around 46% of revenue growing at around 14% organically, so again, you know, really exciting growth rates there. Now, as we've already mentioned, the pandemic did have an impact on the results towards the end of the period during March. And we think that reduced the overall growth rate in the period by around 3%. Now, moving on to slide 22, well, we talk a lot about our passionate audiences and we talk a lot about our revenue diversification. Fundamental and at the heart of our, our model is content. And we can only achieve these great performances through the quality of editorial resources that we have in the business. And I just wanted to highlight the degree of editorial investments we've been making over the last three or four years. You can see that we've invested in editorial has grown by 28% on a CAGR basis over the last four years. And it's been a real area of focus for us. Now that includes um, hiring new um, staff into the organization where we have skills gaps or where we want to launch new brands, but also include some of the ac acquired talent we've brought into the business. Now, moving on to slide 23, this is a new slide for us, which I'm particularly excited to share with you. And I think it really brings to life the virtuous circle um, of our editorial model. And we've talked in the past about the fact that as we invest in new editorial resources, they drive the content that we're going to monetize in the coming years whereas the legacy content we've created in prior years continue to support uh, good revenue streams just now. So what you can see on this chart is 
um, the coloured the coloured bars basically tell you what proportion of revenue came from content created in what period, um, and you can see that more than half of the rev more than half of the revenue that we monetized in April, in fact, probably more like three quarters of it, came from prior periods, which is really strength to the quality of the content that we create, and the fact that we really do understand um, the needs of our audiences and what is important to them. Now. That investment in editorial, coupled with the quality of the archive, is what fundamentally un underpins the audience growth that you'll see on page 24. And what we tried to do on 24 is just look at that in a little bit more detail. You can see on the right hand side a bar chart over the last four years, and the dark grey is the historical future brands. And um, what I wanted to call out is, well, we've added significant audience through our acquisitions, most noticeably through Perch and through uh, the Mobile Nations acquisition, the actual future historical portfolio has almost tripled in the four year period and certainly more than more than doubled. Now, the impact of that growth, the combination of acquired plus historical growth means that future today reaches over a quarter of a billion people online. And we actually talk to just over half of all American men online, which is just a great opportunity for us. And I think when we talk to advertising partners, that's what stands us aside from other large sites, for example, like Facebook, where our audience is coming to us because of the high quality editorial content that we have and with specific needs and interests in place, rather than just that kind of entertain me, I'm a little bit bored. And that's what underpins the value of the audience that we have. Now, I talk a lot about audience, how a brand leadership is also a key part of our strategy. And one of the lessons that I learned from my time at AutoTrader uh, nearly 10 years ago now was about the power of an, a leading market position. And that's particularly true in defensive markets, where there's a flight to quality. During recessions, people consider how and where to spend their ad dollars. And there's a real genuine flight to ensuring that that money gets spent will be spent where it works. And that's where being in the leadership position really matters. And you'll see here that we hold seven leadership positions across our verticals. And within that, we have 18 number one brands. So not only do we have large scalable audience with direct intent, we also have leadership positions, which I think sets us up really well for the coming months. Now on slide 25, I thought it'd be interesting just to look at this in specific detail a little bit more. So I've added two case studies. One which is Tom's Guide, one of our acquired brands, which we acquired in September 2018, so around 20 months ago. And the other on the right hand side is Games Radar, which is one of our oldest brands, well over 10 years old. Now you can clearly see from both charts that our whether the whether the brand is old or new and acquired, our approach results in audiences engaging with us. Tom's Guide has seen 28% CAGR growth in the 24 months since uh, March 2018 where Games Radar has seen a 70% CAGR growth during the same period. Now, when we originally cut this slide, we actually cut the bar charts to April, but April was unprecedented in the growth we saw because of the online audience demand. And so we thought it was more appropriate uh, to actually align this chart with the March period. Um, but I think quite compelling, you can see the degree of audience growth we've had over the, over the last couple of years. And I think that's one of the things that makes me so excited about the opportunity that we see ahead with TI Media, but more of that later. Moving on to the next slide, page 26, I'm just going to briefly uh, call out uh, on our tech stack. I think if we, under, if we all know that content sits at the heart of our business, it's technology which greases the wheel of our future wheel. Over the last six months, we've added eight additional sites to our vanilla platform. So just to think about that in context, that's one every three weeks or so. And that also includes the Christmas embargo period where we won't do anything to our sites during that eight week period from November to January. So very clear velocity within the team around migrating uh, websites onto the vanilla platform. During the year, we also continued to innovate with the addition of both the Smart Brief technology into our monetization stack and the creation of our new lead te generation technology, Falcon, which I'll talk about a little bit more on the next page. So if we could just move now to slide 27, what you can see on the right hand side is an example of our new Falcon technology. One of the things that we'd identified with our e-commerce proposition is that while we are very good at meeting users' needs, um, some instances there is actually a requirement to have a follow-up conversation. And so we felt the need to build lead generation technology and uh, the team 
uh, somewhat uh, amusingly decided to brand that product Falcon. Um, that's currently live on some of our, our sites as an MVP, and we are currently taking uh, lead generation revenue on that proposition, but it's very early stage in our life cycle. And I think, you know, I would draw the analogy, which is that our e-commerce uh, Hawk platform initially only generated £100,000 of revenue in its first year, five year, over five years ago, and today is around a £70 million business. So I think this is a really exciting opportunity for the business over the next few years. We also clearly have continued to invest in our B2B portfolio, which included two new launches in the period, which was the Tech and Learning University and Next TV, which deals with uh, streaming in TV. I think that we couldn't have known when we launched Tech and Learning University how pertinent that would be as we moved into the lockdown period. And you can see the audience engagement significantly grew in March as teaching professionals looked for advice ar around how to run lessons and class plans online. Moving on to slide 28 and touching briefly on our recent acquisitions, I wanted to update you both on Smart Brief and Barcroft. I think the headline here is we're really pleased with both of these uh, acquisitions and how resilient they've been proving through the current crisis. They're certainly really strong additions to the future portfolio. I think the other thing just to call out here at the moment is that both of the integrations have been completed and both businesses are operating within the BAU within the future portfolio. I think one of the key things Penny mentioned is that Smart Brief and Barcroft together significantly increase our revenue mix off platform which is now over 13%, which is really pleasing. Smart Brief also helps diversify our business into B2B ads in new audience and highly engaged uh, readership, where Barcroft, as you'll remember, brings in a much younger demographic to the portfolio. So not just adding a different revenue stream, but also adding different audiences to our business. I think a quick call out to both these businesses in terms of their response to the pandemic. You can see here a picture of the special report on coronavirus and the Smart Brief team were quick to pivot into creating a new daily brief in response to coronavirus and readership and engagement that has been really significant. Well, the Barcroft team have quite amazingly re-engineered their workflows to ensure that they can continue to create 40 original films for the AVOD channels during the lockdown period, which I think is pretty amazing when you think they're producing roughly two per day and yet we're all maintaining social distancing. Moving on to slide 29, I wanted to give you an update on the TI acquisition, um, which we um, were fortunate to complete just an, over a month ago. As we flagged at the time of the deal, uh, last November, we've been quite quick to act on the disposal of non-core or overlap areas as indicated by the CMA. And as we expected, that resulted in a reduction in revenue of around about 12 million pounds, but almost no impact on earnings. We would probably anticipate there's some other minor changes to make in the portfolio over the coming months as we ensure that the brands and the business, we, we have the brands and the businesses that we need to deliver the strategy in these change times. We don't particularly expect that those changes will have any impact on earnings, but it may have a small impact on revenue. Today, TI brings to us 38 brands and over 21 million users online. And I think there's a real exciting opportunity to exploit the future strategy within these audiences and brands. Looking at that in a little bit more detail on slide 30, as I'm sure you would expect of us, we've been working hard over the last six months to just think through how we're going to execute on that strategy. And we've kind of segmented that into three distinct areas, people, processes and systems. Within the, the people work stream, work is clearly under, underway thinking about how we can make sure we onboard and induct our new colleagues well. And we're also looking to add four of the TI executives to my management team. With regards to processes, one of the things we pivoted into is to create the future online university, <clears throat> a picture of which I think you can see, uh, which means that even if we're working from home, we can ensure everyone has the access to the training that they need during the process of the integration periods. And then from a systems perspective, we've been spending lots of time diligencing both the future systems and the TI systems to think about what best of breed looks like. And we are expecting to be in a position to launch or migrate six to eight brands prior to the Christmas period. Now, just moving on to slide 31, I'm not going to dwell on this, but it's just a snapshot of some of the planning documentations that have been in place and that we've been working on as we think through our approach to the integration. And our approach here is consistent with what we've done in the past, whereby we split the project into two phases, phase one being integration planning, phase two being optimization, which is more about delivering the revenue opportunity. The little uh, screenshot you can see there on what to watch is one of the new domains we've acquired, which is whattowatch.com. 
uh, which we're hoping to launch, launch quite quickly. And as you'll remember, the issue we had was the existing TI brand didn't have a .com a domain available for us. So we're very excited about having acquired what to watch. Then moving on to slide 32, I wanted to just bring out the strategy for TI in a little bit more detail for you. Again, moving from left to right, we've kind of picked up the three core areas where we see opportunities for the future strategy at TI. That's around growing audience and brands. It's about creating diversification across the business. And it's about creating operating leverage within the portfolio. And then again, top to bottom, we're thinking about that in terms of what can we do for today? What can we do that we think will have an impact in 12 months time? And what can we do which we think is much more longer term? Again, there's lots of detail in here and I'm not going to pick up all the points, but I just wanted to, to highlight a few, which is, you know, one of the things we see that we're really excited about is the ability to, to deploy the e-commerce Hawk technology and our ad tech stack hybrid onto the existing audiences that we have with TI and the ability to monetize those. We're also really excited about the existing infrastructure we have within the US, which means that we're able to um, de deliver our US growth plans quickly without having to significantly increase scale there. And then finally, you know, we really do see an opportunity to grow the audience reach of the existing brands through the, through the execution of the best practice we saw earlier with the case studies for both Tom's Guide and Games Radar. So I think slide, slide 33 kind of summarizes where we see ourselves at this moment. These are uh, really uncertain uh, times. And I think the thing that I would want you to, to leave this call with is uh, the certainty that we are very attuned to all of our dashboards and we monitor everything in our business for very slight variations, which is why we were able to react very quickly as the lockdown happened, or also how we've been able to equally um, uh, unwind or put in more investment as we've seen required. And we're very sensitive to the changes in the landscape, both with regards to our people, our products, and the wider environment in which we operate. I think that operational focus in our business that we have, well, also that um, real heartbeat about delivering strategy is what's enabled us to deliver such a strong set of first half results. We have a real proven business model, and even in these unprecedented times and the downturn that we're insured we're ensured to face. Our colleagues have proved resilient, passionate and flexible, and that's resulted in our productivity and engagement being as high as ever. Our expectations at board level for the full year profit remain unchanged, and we remain really excited about the operating model we've created as we think about the opportunities that lie ahead.